Hi, welcome to this brief lesson on design methodology. This is meant for uh, people who are trying to figure out what is meant by design methodology and why we should know it, something like that. So I will try and step you through this process and uh, we will see whether we can make sense out of it. So by the way, my name is Arun Srinivasa and I am at the Texas A&M University. I am a professor in the mechanical engineering department. So let's see. Yeah, there you go. Let's make sure I pick the correct color for this thing. Okay. So, you know, to understand the purpose, I mean, what is what is this whole design methodology idea? Let us start with a very simple thing. What is an engineer? What does an engineer do? You may have several answers. You know, many of you think roughly something along the lines that somehow they are uh, they are people who solve problems or something like that. But I want you to understand that they do two functions. They identify societal needs and then develop products and processes to satisfy their need in the presence of constraints. So notice that there are three pieces to it. So let me sh let me show you how the, uh, before we plunge in let me just give you an idea of how this whole presentation works can you see this black stuff here this is my board this is where I'll I'll do like free form writing type of thing this side will have the major ideas I will try and not write anything on the white side but I will not always succeed you know uh, I'm human and I keep making mistakes so I will write on this stuff occasionally by mistake Generally speaking, all the major points are on are on the white side. All the incidental points that I want to make, drawings, equations, those kinds of things are on the black side. Okay, so that's meant to be like a blackboard. Got the idea, right? So let's see if we can. I went kind of ahead. Okay, so this is what an engineer does: they identify societal needs. Okay, so the the key element is this. Combination of science, math and experience to make rational decisions. And of course, you know, everybody says rational decisions. Well, what do we mean by that? Is that, is that these are decisions based on actual considerations of reality and not what we perceive. And there is a huge difference between these two things and I will give you several examples. Now, there is a fundamental difference between what a scientist does and what an engineer does. A scientist is one who creates explanations of how nature works. Engineers create products using these, uh, using these understandings, using these explanations to help them make rational decisions. Again, I mentioned this word rational decision, but that's something that uh, we will have to, we will have to figure out what exactly that means. What is it that we are trying to combat here? Okay. So let's get, go down into the details. Well, why do we need a design process? The problem is something that is, uh, quite subtle. And it deals with how our subconscious brain works. So what happens is that our subconscious brain, the, the you know the, the part that enables us to do intuitive thinking, was developed. Uh, at least I mean, let me be. Let me give you a caveat before I plunge into all of this. Okay, I am by no means a, a you know somebody who knows something about cognitive science or something like that. Most of the stuff that I'm talking about is only very vague. So don't take my word for it. Just think of it as useful guidelines and then you have to go and read something about cognitive science if you are interested in this area. So I am by no means an expert. So what I say is probably not correct, but it sounds good. So be careful about that. Okay. So our subconscious brain has some fundamental flaws that make us make it very difficult to design complex things. Our subconscious brain was built to make quick decisions for, for our survival. Okay, and it was based on an essentially static environment. So what happens is, I don't think too much. Uh, last time I walked this way, I heard a crackle and next moment there was a tiger that jumped on me. So next time around, what I will do is, whenever I hear a crackle, I think it's a tiger. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take any chances. That's how the subconscious brain, so, brain works. So one has to be careful about what happens to a subconscious brain. First thing it does, and this is a major problem, is that it focuses on specifics. Let me give you an example. Okay, I want you to design a hammer. Okay, so think about what you would do. So think about what what you would do to design a hammer. Okay, go ahead. What I want you to do is pause, think for a second, and then come back, and then you can see what I had, what you had, and you know you could you could uh, you could think about it. Okay, so 
Did you pause? Did you think about it for a second? Okay, so did you have something that says, okay, hammer looks, you know, you want to design something like this? Right? Hammer. Okay, notice what happened. You didn't think of what does a hammer do. You just thought of what a hammer looks like. Right? And immediately you came up with a picture that was roughly what was in your mind as to what you mean by a hammer. Okay? But I didn't tell you what kind of hammer, did I? Could have been a jack hammer and it looks very, very different. It looks like this. And with some big handle here. That could be a hammer. Or I could have a stone. That's a hammer. Or I could have, you know, if you if you've been to Sears, you will see a very very cool uh, nailing system, which could be a nail gun. Okay. Nowadays they even sell these hammers that are impact hammers that are pretty good. That they don't look anything like this at all. So what happens to most of us is that we get too detailed, we get into specifics immediately, and we don't look at other possibilities. So you might say, well, what's the big deal about getting into specifics? That's what I do all the time. The problem is your designs will be extremely stunted. Let me give you an example. Okay, until iPod, uh, until the iPhone came along, people always thought that in order to enter text, I needed to have a keyboard. And people were trying, they were designing uh, phones that had different kinds of keyboards. You know, there were phones which had like, you, if you remember the Blackberry, it had a keyboard right underneath the main thing. You had phones in which the keyboard was in the back, all kinds of things, right? That's because we went into the specifics of talking about keyboards and not about the fact that you needed to enter information into your, into your computer. Uh, along came the iPhone and it had no keyboard, but it still was just perfectly fine for most of the functions. So I want you to understand that this actually restricts designs. Okay. The next one is it does not consider alternatives. And of course, you need to understand that uh, this is a very key point because, you know, if you are going to be attacked by a lion, there is no point in thinking about what, what else could that twig snapping be. It's time for you to run for your life. So what happens is it goes for the most obvious and not necessarily for the outlier things which could also be possible. And this is good to save our life, but this is not good for designing things. Okay. Another problem that it has is the problem of familiarity. Now, this might sound very weird. So, let me give you an example. Okay. So, you know, we had this horrible, horrible uh, the world's largest terrorist attack uh, on 9-11 uh, in which it killed 3,000 people, right? Yeah. So what happened immediately after that? People stopped flying because you immediately say, okay, that was a dangerous thing, so I shouldn't fly. You know what was the net result of that? This is bizarre. You can go look at the statistics. Something of the order of 15,000 people more died in the United States because they chose not to fly and they chose to drive. What I want you to understand is that driving is far more dangerous than flying. And even with a with a with an event as severe and tragic as 9/11, flying was still safer than driving. The most dangerous thing that you do when you take a flight overseas is driving to the airport. Right? This it doesn't seem right. You know, we are so familiar with driving, but for flying we are we don't do that all often. So it looks to us as if flying is more dangerous. But in terms of number of times you travel and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in terms of the total distance you take and per mile, it's, uh, flying is much safer than driving. So I want you to understand that we make irrational decisions because we think that things that are familiar are less dangerous, things that happen rarely are more dangerous. Right? Because dangerous things happen rarely, that's, that's our assumption. And of course, that's not true. Okay? So our decision making process is somewhat flawed. And now comes, okay, you can say, well, okay, for decision making process is so flawed, what's the big deal? Why are we not, uh, you know, why, then why do we call ourselves rational, rational beings? I have a smart, smart part, frontal lobe, I'm able to think, you know, what is that 
what does that do and here is where we have a very interesting aspect for our decision making setup what happens is that rather than our frontal lobe trying to con trying to make decisions for us it appears that typically speaking what happens is that our subconscious makes random association and comes up with an idea Okay, so our subconscious is what is called an associative memory. It will associate all kinds of things if they happen together. So that is the reason why you know a particular smell evokes your childhood or something like that because of the fact that the sense of smell, that particular smell is connected with your childhood. There is no rational connection, I want you to understand. But because they happen together, it will connect. So this is both a blessing and a curse. It is a blessing because you can come up with very, very unusual connections. It is a curse because it will actually interfere with rationality. There is no causality in the connection. There is no reason for why these two things are connected. So, it is a problem. So, what happens is that, you know, our rational brain is used for rationalization. Once I decide I like it, I then find reasons for liking it. It is not the other way around. You can see why we say that our rational brain is not that great, right? So, it is completely backwards from the way we would like to think the way we work. I mean, this is not always the case. There are always exceptions. You need to, you need to think about that. But sometimes this is how it works. Okay. The problem for invoking rationality, why is it that our rational brain is that way? Because it is a slow process. You can see that the one place where rationality is demanded most, the one place where rationality is demanded mo most is in mathematics. The kind that you learn mostly involves rational brain. And it is slow. That's why you have so much problem with mathematics. Because our rational, we are not that good, guys. I mean, we are really slow. You know, our subconscious brain is like a supercomputer, our rational brain is like a watch. That's how much how much cap capability it has. By, the, by that I mean, you know, that little processor in a watch, that's all it does. It's an extremely crude setup. Okay. By the way, we I can show you that it cannot keep more than seven things in memory. This is actually a very interesting phenomenon. So, people have done experiments where they trick you into a variety of things. One of the experiments that was done was a very interesting one. So, what they did was they were auctioning some items. Let us say they auctioned a phone, uh, a keyboard, etc. Okay, bunch of things that they were going to auction. Before the auction, you have to list your UIN. Or in their case, they listed their social security number. Okay. And then they were asked a crazy question. Whatever is the last two digits of your social security number, why don't you, uh, will you bid that much? And you could say yes or no for any of the items. And then people, some of them said yes, some of them said no. By the way, all of this is irrelevant. I will show you in a second. So then what happens is they started the bidding process and then they looked at the results. So, if your social security number was high, the amount that you bid was high. If your social security number was low, the amount that you bid was low. Okay. So, for example, for a phone, if your social security number ended in 00, zero you might only bid 5 bucks for the phone. But if a social security number was 89, you may bid $75 for the same phone. Right? And I wonder what the heck is happening. It's actually a very clever trick. What it is is that the way your 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 brain comes up with estimates, numbers, is by looking at whatever was the last number that was in your head and rounding it up or down. So compared to zero zero, five bucks looks expensive. Compared to eighty nine, seventy five dollars looks cheap. You see what I mean? So, this is a very interesting trick. In fact, in many cases, this is the trick that is used in, in uh, uh, when you go and you buy things, uh, let us say a car or something like that, sticker, the sticker price, 
is meant to give you a number from which you compare. They don't care if you don't pay the sticker price. But if your sticker price is high, you will bid high. If your sticker price is low, you will bid low. That's how it works. So when you go to Sam's Club or Walmart or one of these things and you see all these TVs, the numbers are, they are trying to impress those numbers into your head. And then you will go and based on that number, you may think that the stuff in, in, in those stores are cheap. So I want you to understand that that's how our subconscious brain thinks and that's what uh, marketers actually manipulate. So they manip manipulate fundamental things, you know, greed, fear, lust, that kind of stuff, right? You cannot design items based on those kinds of feelings because you will come up with extremely bad designs, okay? That's why we need a design methodology, okay? What happens to us is that if you are presented with too many alternatives, we, give, we become indecisive. So if I tell you there are 45 different courses and then you have to pick three, it is very hard for you to do because there are too many courses to keep in mind. So what we do is we randomly simplify. We just ignore some alternatives. We just aggregate some things. So we say, okay, all these courses start with S. So they are all one course. I will just aggregate it. I will do one of these kinds of activities. So I want you to understand that in many cases we make dramatic simplifications based on the fact that we have to make some decision. And this is what we mean by prejudice. So over time we have a scheme for simplifying our decisions. And simplifying our... So this gives rise to prejudge. That's why it's called prejudice. It is prejudging. Okay. So again you can see, I'm sure you can see how this is bad for designing new things. Because you will not see all the alternatives. You will neglect some. You will make random choices in terms of this. So you want to have a systematic way of this way. By the way, advertisers really use this for branding. So you want to know, okay, there are 10 different types of cola. So what would you pick? Coca-Cola or Pepsi or something like that. So it's easy for you to do. So you go there, you don't want to pick toothpaste, you want to pick Colgate. Right? Because it narrows down your choice from vast number of toothpaste to a few. Otherwise, you'll just be, you'll have what is called decision paralysis. You can't do anything. Okay? The rational way to do this where you consider all the all these things, but you don't keep seven things more than seven things in mind, is to do it hierarchically, step by step. You make a big decision, and then from the big decision you make smaller, smaller like that. So this hierarchical decision making is at the heart of a design process. So we want to make sure that in the hierarchy we have looked at all our possibilities and we are searching through this hierarchy in a systematic way. This is a major point. Okay, so what do we mean by this? See, there is a huge problem for us as designers, which is that we have a combination of two things. I have to be an artist or an innovator or a craftsman. So I make some product. So here is the iPod. Okay, it looks cool. It's beautiful. All kinds of things are there. There are little switches to the side. It is absolutely elegant. Okay, this is the part where I am the artist. I suddenly have to switch around. An artist needs the ability to integrate many systems. You have to be able to say, okay, the iPod has to have, have a, have a, you know, have a, an iPhone has to have a, a camera in the front, a camera in the back, switches, this, that. How do I put it all together? So this is the integration part. Okay, you need to have, in order to be a good artist, you need to have a high level understanding of functionality. What I mean by that is, you need to know what a camera does. You don't necessarily need to know how it does it for the purpose of designing, for the purpose of innovating. You know, you need to say, okay, I need a camera here, I need a camera that's only this size and I need to have an idea what it does. So, therefore, I can make a decision where to put it. But I don't really need to know at this level how it does. Okay, we talked about that. Then you have to switch. This is the difference between a pure inventor and an engineer. As an engineer, you have to now suddenly switch. You have to become an art critic. You have to figure out, you have to evaluate your design. Evaluation is at the heart of engineering. You have many alternatives, you have to pick one. And we do this by computing some numbers. 
So our basic skill as an engineer is to convert numbers into decisions. Figure out what number to compute or measure or whatever. Use the numbers and then figure out what decision to make. This takes some doing but this is the core competence. Now if you want to evaluate you need to have the ability to do diagnostics. Diagnostics are at the crux of evaluation. I need to figure out why it works the way it works. How does it work? Now you switch. If you want to evaluate something, you need to know in detail how it does. If you don't know how it does, you will not be able to evaluate. So when you work for a company or when you, when you are the boss and you have 20 employees and you need to evaluate them, you need to know how are they doing in their jobs. Not just what jobs they are doing. You need to figure out, okay, exactly what did they do, how did they do it, why did they run into trouble, all this stuff, right? That means you should know what the job entails. Otherwise, you will be considered a useless manager. Because you don't know whether this job was difficult or easy. It's the same deal. When you look at a design and you need to evaluate, you need to know whether something is difficult or easy. Okay, so now let's look at some common ways of designing. So, the first way and this is what most students are used to. So, let us say I give you an assignment. I ask you to do some problem. What do you do? You do, you come up with an idea. Right? Let's speak yellow. So, you come up with an idea. Then, what do you do? Typically, you go and ask your teacher. Sir, is this right? Did I do the right thing? Or something like that. That is this check with client. The teacher looks at it and says, nah, this is not right, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right, right? And then you go and you come back up with a new idea. Okay? Here, I want you to understand you are playing only the role of innovator. Not critic. Okay? And it is ad hoc innovation. Who is really doing the high level thinking here? You are just going with your gut feeling. Can you see that? Innovators require a lot of intuitive feeling. So you are going with your gut feeling. Who is doing the higher rational thing, thought? It's not you. It's your client. Or in, in, or in this case of a homework exercise. So in this particular case, client does the high level thinking. You are just doing homework. This is not a viable way to survive as an engineer today. If you want to be a good engineer and move up and you become a, and you become a manager or you, you start running your own business, these kinds of things where you are really valued as an engineer, your value is not at the level of just coming up with intuitive ideas. You need to take over the role of evaluator so that your client has solutions and not problems to deal with. You see what I mean? So, this is our old version. This is not what we want to do. Let us look at a slightly better one. Now, what happens is, I again start out with some idea. I designed something. So, I got this hammer. I made a hammer like this. And you said, okay, does it work well? So, I maybe, I, I build it, I test it, and then I say, okay, does it pass? If it passes, I show the client. If not, I go back and fix it. Okay, notice that the first step to this was a intuitive idea. What I want you to understand is that with all of these, we tend to lead with our intuition. This is not a good thing. This will restrict your ideas. I told you about what happens when you do with your intuition. It will get you too close to the specifics 
and it will ignore some really good opportunities because you are using your subconscious brain to lead you and that's not a good thing. You need to go further up, higher up the hierarchy. So this is better but not good. The problem here is, this is what, by the way, this is the level at which most senior design projects are being done and we are very unhappy about it. This is not even at the level at which we want you to think. We want you to go a little bit higher up. So this is the kind of stuff that you will do when you do like a design of uh, experiments or something. Come up with some crude idea and be done with it. And then the crude idea will not work. What happens many times is that fix it is not possible only if you can. And then you will go and you will see that some things, some things are missing or your client forgot you to tell something and then you are in a big mess. Okay, usually speaking, the initial design will take one day. This iterative process will take one year. And by the time you finish, you may have to redesign this 10 different times. So this is not viable. This is how we were doing design. This is not viable. Why? So let me give you an example. Uh, when I, when I'm, I'm using Apple as an example because they came up with some really innovative designs, and most of you are familiar with with uh, with this as a consumer good. But they were also really amazing designs. So, for example, when Apple came up with the iPod, you know, it's it did not have any competition for maybe about a year and a half or two years. You know, then we had all the Zoom and this, that, and the other. But it took them a while to come up. Okay, so that was the lead time from their design to some of their competitors. By the time they came up with the iPhone, six months later, competitors had, and today there are iPhones, for example, I mean, the HTC, uh, the Android phones, for example, that are quite comparable. Right? So think about it this way. Their, their preeminence in their design is six months. With the iPad, by the time they realized it, there were other companies that were already talking about it. Right? So what happens is, you cannot maintain your competitive advantage. You cannot wait for a redesign for a long time. You cannot wait one year for a redesign. You have to get a redesign that works right within the first one or two trials. So this is something that uh, large companies like Boeing and many car companies have got very good at. For example, the Boeing 777, their first flight was successful. They didn't have any major problems. It was almost entirely built in software because they knew how to think about it in a slightly different way. So what I want you to understand is that leading with the intuition causes delays. Okay, so that's something that you need to think about when you do these kinds of things. Okay. Now we have a better, uh, better approach which is you create an idea and then before you start evaluating you figure out what do the parts do. So my classic example for a hammer, you had an idea that it should look like this. You ask yourself what is the purpose of this part? What is it supposed to do? So you can replace, so you can think that's the head. Okay, what does the head do? It actually stores momentum. Because the ultimate purpose and it also delivers impulse. Now you can say, hmm, so did I need, really need to do that? Yeah, I needed to do that because the purpose of a hammer is to deliver some impulse to a body. You know, you know, impulse, right? It's the high force over a short period of time. That's what it does. For impulse, in order for something to deliver impulse, it has to carry momentum. That's the purpose of the head. You can think uh, an extreme case like a sledgehammer. You know, you need to, you need to generate momentum and you do that by using gravity and it generates enormous impulse. There are other ways to do it. A jackhammer on the other hand, a power, a power hammer on the other hand 
generates impulse by means of like pneumatic pulses or something like that, the air pressure. So there are many different ways of generating impulse. I'm just giving you one. Okay. So abstraction of fun functionality will suddenly allow you to think about it in a slightly different way and ask, oh, okay, that's what it's supposed to be doing. Then I can say, if that's what it's supposed to be doing, how well is it doing? So I know what it is supposed to do. I can ask how well it is doing and by that itself, I may be able to do a redesign. So I want you to understand that that's a major point with regard to redesigning something. Now we come to the real deal. Okay. The best way to do this, at least what I think is the best way, there are maybe others who don't think that that's the best way, is three steps. Creation, where you create an idea. Abstraction, where you look at the idea and extract out what it is supposed to do and then evaluate it and you repeat the cycle. But notice that it doesn't start with creating the idea. It starts with what is called a need analysis. What is needed? What do we need to do? You analyze that. Then you look at you break it down. So this is look at like a task breakdown. Then you figure out how. So I want you to understand why, why is this question followed by what is this question followed by how is this. Right? The question, as soon as we figure out what is needed, you need to know how do we measure success. Okay, just to give you an example. When we started, when we start a class, what do we ask the question? What is the first thing that you want to know? What do I need to do to get an A in this class? Okay, I look at this and it says strength of materials or something like that or design of machine elements or something and it has some list of things. So this is what I need to do. Oh, I got to do a project. I got to do this. I got to do that. All of this stuff. Great. So the next question you immediately want to know is when are the exams and how is the grading going to be? That's this one. That's the spec specification. Okay. So we do need analysis. Then we do specification. Then we get into this business about what do you need to do? And then I say, okay, I will, I will teach you this and then you have to do a homework and then, you know, you get into this and then you say, how do I do the homework? Once you figured out how to do it, then what happens is I come and I do an evaluation. The point for you to think about is, when you get back the sheet, I want you to understand that grading of a homework or grading of these things is not judgment. It is feedback. So you look at it and say, hmm, how do I, how did I do this? I go back here and I rethink what I need to do. And this cycle will be much shorter because I know how to measure success. I know what, what was supposed to be done. So there are two cycles. There is one here. And there is one here. Right? There is an upper cycle and a lower cycle. The middle portion which is abstraction of uh, abstraction functionality. What task do, do, do needs to be done is the critical thing. That is common to both the cycles. So the upper cycle, this one. The upper cycle is the high level stuff. This is when you are negotiating with the client. The lower cycle is the detail stuff. So this is high level. This is detail. And the idea is you need to do both of them. So you have to constantly keep switching your hat between the high level cycle and the detail cycle. This is what design is all about. Okay, so we are going to stop here. I want you to take a break and come back. There is more.
So let me stop this. There you go.